All right, I have a 2005 Honda Accord. Anybody have a 2005 Honda Accord? Just me, just me. <laughs> All right, I see where this is going. It's got four JL subwoofers in the back. Anybody else have four JL subwoofers? That's what I thought. <laughs> really does. Uh, it's full of amps and, and, and it has a whole row of JL subwoofers in the back and it has a false trunk. So you can't hang with me when I pull up at a stoplight as a 46-year-old white man bumping some hip hop. <laughs> okay, now, now listen, you might, you didn't see that coming at all, did you? You're like, I, is this Office Space, the movie? All right, so, <clears throat> so that's for you guys that go back a ways, all right? Now, the reason that I have this system was because of something that happened a few years ago. I was meeting with, the, I was baptizing some people one day and this girl that I was about to baptize was crying and she was probably in her, in her maybe early 30s. And, and so here's about 10 people about to be baptized, and, and I'm meeting with them, and she's crying. I said, what's wrong? Her name's Michelle. What's wrong? Uh, my husband wouldn't come to my baptism. Why not? Well, he's just not into it. What's he doing? He's at the mall shopping, you know? So, so she, I baptized her that day. I said, do you mind if I call your husband? She said, I'll give you his number. Will you call him? That'd be great. I called him the next day. And I said, hey, you want, to get, you want to get coffee or breakfast or lunch sometime? And he had been showing up to our church for a little while, sitting in the back row. Like, he, he, would, he would jet out real quick. Big guy, huge biceps, like cut up, was a physical trainer. So he agrees to get lunch with me. So we, he wants to meet at Panera. You have a Panera here? So we, eat at, we meet at Panera. I roll up in my 2005 Honda Accord, all right? He rolls up in a $75,000 monster truck, all right? Turns out he's got a lot of money. He has a truck that a ladder rolls down and he gets down. And then we meet for like two hours. He starts crying at Panera, becomes a Christian at Panera. All right, his name's Mark. I'm not gonna say his last name because you're gonna vi video this, all right? Then he goes, so what are you doing for the rest of the day? I said, well, I've got, I got a full day of stuff planned. You know, he's like, come on, let's hang out for the rest of the day. So I'm like, well, he just became a Christian. I guess I probably should hang out with him for the rest of the day. So he goes, he goes, come on, what do you want to do? I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, this is kind of awkward. I'm climbing up in your monster truck and we're going to go hang out for the rest of the day. So we get in his truck, he turns on the stereo system and it's booming. And I like bass, I always have, you know. And so, so I said, where'd you get this system? He's like, oh, you want one? I'm like, no, that's not what I was saying. I was just, where did you get this? Si An hour later, we're driving over to some stereo shop in my 2005 Honda Accord with his friends that have been featured on MTV seven times or something, uh, and they pimp my ride. <laughs> so, so anyways, and I, I kid you not, now, I don't drive that 2005 Honda Accord anymore. Guess who drives it now? My son. Or I just passed it to him, and because uh, he drives it now, and he loves it. <laughs> All right, now, but, you know, it's hard when you have a system like that in your car. Anybody have a system in their car like that? You're like anti-stock systems, you know what I'm talking about? It's hard when you have a system like that in your car to not want to throw on a little hip hop and let it rumble, right? You just want to, especially if you pull up to a stoplight and somebody else thinks they have something. You're, you're like, I'm going to, I'll show you what I got back here, you know? So, so anyways, and so as I'm driving down the road as a 40 year old white man bumping Jay-Z, I realize a lot of the lyrics that you hear in hip hop music, it's, 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 it's fascinating, you know, the way that women are often portrayed in that world. And my son is really into hip hop music, which there are, you know, probably cleaner genres of music that you can listen to. But he was a basketball player. That was always the culture. They always thought it was really funny that in the warm ups before the game, the coach had no idea what the lyrics were that were playing that were just completely uh, filthy by all the students and the fans knew him. And so my son really likes hip hop music. But one of the, one of the themes that really stands out to me so much, especially as I have girls that have started to grow up, is just the way that women so often are portrayed in that world. All right, the way that women are exploited and sexually sexually objectified in 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 not just that musical genre, but all over the place. I mean, if you've ever, I haven't been down to the Vegas Strip very often in my life because I'm not a big, you know, I think I've spent like $8 on a slot machine in my whole life because it just doesn't interest me really. But I've walked through a casino before and seen lots and lots and lots of scandalous looking <laughs> women in casinos, you know, because so often um, it's just interesting. I wouldn't want my daughter to, to look like that or dress like that, but that's everywhere in our society. And, you know, we, we, we live at the beach, uh, close to the beach. We spend a lot of time at the beach. My youngest two are surfers. My wife is a surfer. And, 
And, and it's, it's amazing that, and I'm not trying to be too crass here because I know there's even kids in the room, but I, I don't know if you've noticed how small the swimsuits have gotten in the last three years. In just the last three years. It's all of a sudden like gone to a whole new level. And the people that are wearing those swimsuits are the teenagers. That's who's wearing, it's like the 15 and 16 year old girls because they don't even get it that there's like 40 year old men that are looking at them on the beach. All right, now all this has become fresh in my mind as I'm parenting a 15 year old daughter who someone asked to the homecoming dance a couple days ago, so I showed him my gun, uh, you know, so, so and, 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 and um, I realized many of you, many of us, even I was watching the, the football game last night, and have you ever been to an NFL game? It's a, I've been to quite a few, and I tried to get season tickets to the Rams when they came to town because they're not going to be any good, but we, I thought it would be fun anyways to go, you know? But if you've ever been to an NFL game and sat down by the cheerleaders, it's a pretty crazy view down there. Like, it's a, the, what we are inundated with all the time in terms of how we see women, treat women, interact with our wives... The way we do that in society is oftentimes very different the way it's done in society than what God is calling us to do, all right? And here's what I would say. Many Christian men, all right, M many Christian men have embraced wrong ideas of how to treat women, have no idea how to treat a woman or love a woman, all right? Both married guys and single guys, and, you know, sometimes people will say Christianity, you know, represses women. You know, you'll hear people say that sometimes. But historically, Christianity raised the dignity, freedom, and rights of women to le levels never before known in any other culture or religion. In fact, one historian put it like this. The birth of Jesus was the turning point in the history of women. All right? So, so against a, a backdrop of a society that often either defeminizes women or sees women primarily in terms of male sexual conquests. My son just started watch, my, my son just started community college because he graduated high school a year early. It's a long story. So he's going to do a year at community college. And so he just started community college. So he was feeling a little down about it. So the first night we put on the show Community. Like, let's watch it as a family. Remember the show Community? Because, you know, things seem a lot cleaner until you watch them with your kids. So you're like, I think Community's all right. And then you're watching it with your mother-in-law. And you're like, that's not clean at all. Like, don't go see the movie 300 with your mother-in-law. It was my wife's idea, but she was sitting next to me. All right, anyways, I'm just saying, don't do that. All right, she's 70. All right, so, so what I'm saying is we started watching the show Community. We watched because we thought it would be funny. And the whole first season, we finally, like after four or five episodes, we're like, we cannot watch this show with our kids. Because it's about that main character who used to be on Talk Soup, like sexual exploits. How many women? You know, that sort of thing. So, so all that to say, we either defeminize women or we see them as, as, as sexual objects, all right? But, but women are created in the image of God, are sisters in Christ, and are extremely valuable in the plan of God. So I want, I want to give you a whole bunch of things here in terms of how does a follower of Christ love a woman? I think I have nine things here. Don't worry, I won't take 20 minutes on each one. The first five are for married men. The last four are for all of us. All right, I've spoken and preached enough to know that if you're a single dude and you're sitting out there, you might go, man, it feels like everything in the church for families and married men and how do I love my kids? So if you're single and you're here, no, no, this is for you. Even the first, even the first five that are for married guys, you need to learn these things now because when you, you might not have learned this from your dad. And when you roll into a marriage, you need to be ready to practice this. And the last four, Apply to single guys especially, and all of us as well. All right, so here we go. I want to read a text in Ephesians chapter 5. I don't know if you brought your Bibles or if you didn't, so I didn't know if you would or if you wouldn't, so I put all the texts on the screen. So I'm going to read Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 33. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, 
And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, in Ephesians, Paul uses 41 words to teach wives their role in a Christian marriage. And how many words he uses for husbands? 116. 41 for wives, 116 for husbands. He obviously saw the treatment of and love of wives to be quite important. Now, what does is, what is Paul say in this text in terms of how should a man relate to his wife? Three times in the text, verses 25, 28, and 33, Paul says the, the way that we relate to our wives is to love them. And, and how are we to do this? Paul tells us to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Now, how much did Christ love the church? Like on a scale of one to 10. It's pretty big, right? Right? And then he says, and, and, and gave himself up for her, right? He died for her. And then Paul tells us to love our wives as our own bodies. Now, some of you might be, you know, you might not care when you experience pain. There are weird people out there like that game when Emmett Smith dislocated his shoulder and then played the rest of the game. You remember that? It's like, I'm just going to keep playing for the rest of the game with the dislocated shoulder. Most of us, when we're hurt, we take care of ourselves. Like, I have a hurt right knee right now. Want to know why? Because I was doing squats a couple of weeks ago, and somehow I still feel like I got to compete for that green shirt that I could get in high school if I could squat 400 pounds. Because I, you know, so I, so I get out there and I read this stuff, like you need to lift heavy weights. So I'm squatting a couple weeks ago and I'm, and something in the front of my knee right here. And literally just walking up the stairs right now hurts. And I, I don't like that because then I feel like I'm going to start gaining weight and I can't work out and I can't run. When, when something's wrong with our body, we generally tend to take care of ourselves. That's why Paul uses that analogy. Like you nurse, you nurse that knee as you walk up the stairs. Paul says, love your wife with two sort of graphic examples here. All right, now the word love means to seek the highest good for the person loved. Think about that. To seek the highest good for the person loved. This is love that, that has nothing to do with whether or not a person deserves to be loved. It's not a feeling of love. It's a giving, serving, unselfish love. All right, now how can I love my wife in this way, I told you I have nine principles, all right? Let's start with the first five, how to love a woman as a married man. I'm going to be very practical here with you, all right? This is really simple, all right? And there's some notes. I didn't give you fill in the blanks because you, because I know you're not dumb. You can write the whole thing, all right? The first very simple thing is be present. How can I love my wife? Be present. Understand the importance of your presence. Now, don't raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass you. But how many of you had a dad who wasn't present? All right? A lot of us in this room had a dad who wasn't present. Some of you had no dad at all. Like, he just wasn't around, didn't come around. Some of you maybe had a dad who worked constantly, was never around at all. And maybe your dad was around, but he cracked open a beer from the moment he got home and started drinking, and, you know, nine cores lights later, he wasn't really present. All right, you want to love your wife, men? Be present. All right, be present. Understand that the most important thing you bring to your family is your transformed and transforming presence. My wife and I met with a counselor for like uh, a year, like six years ago. We weren't mad at each other. We were just kind of, we'd been kind of beaten up in ministry. We were tired. I'd been a pastor for a lot of years. I was serving in this big church, and, and our elders were like, uh, we'll pay for any pastor to go to counseling with Rich and Jim Plass, who were going to come here and do a marriage conference, like two old gospel voodoo kind of dudes, <laughs> all right? So, so we sat with them for, for every other week for a couple of years, it was or for, for like a year or a year and a half, and they taught, they taught me this. I'm a productivity guy. I would rather work than sleep. I'd rather start a company than watch TV. That's just the way I think. I, I'm not saying it's character. I'm just carved out like that. You give me a day off, it's like I'm cleaning the garage. I just, I just like, I like getting stuff done. You know, so I really enjoy that. But what Rich and Jim helped me to see is the most important thing about you is not your productivity, it's your presence. It's simply the fact that you're there. All right, you can't love your wife as Christ loved the church and as your own body if you're constantly somewhere else. You understand that? 
Physical presence is a big part of this. This means you have to say no to a lot of things. Remember when I first got married, I got married right after college, 23 years old. And in college, uh, I played ultimate Frisbee with a group of guys. You guys know what ultimate Frisbee is? It's just a really fun game when you're young and can run around on a field and that sort of thing. It's a fun, active game. We'd play like four or five nights a week. And I remember I got married, lived in the same town, and all the guys were like, ultimate Frisbee tonight, right? I was like, yeah, I'll be there at six. But I got a wife now. I said, I can't play ultimate Frisbee every single night. Now, I didn't feel... I didn't feel bummed out about that. I felt like, oh, there's a new, like, this is a new reality. I've got to say no to some things. You know, I, I moved to the beach for five years to Huntington Beach, and I, I, I never learned to surf. Everybody else was going surfing. I just thought, I have a wife and two little kids. I still don't surf to this day. I tried in Hawaii like two months ago. It's not very easy, you guys. My son's like flying over the top of me, and I'm about to die. And, and so, you know, so I'm like, man, my neck hurts. Do I have to keep paddling some more? You know, can someone paddle me around. Anyways, so, you know, I remember I played golf when I first, uh, when I first got married. I didn't play golf because I was rich. I played golf because I worked on a youth staff. I worked for a pastor and he liked to play golf. So he would take me to play golf. So he would pay and take me to play golf. And so I played golf for four or five years. And then I didn't play golf for like 10 years that I really don't play now either because I'm not any good. But the main reason I stopped playing is you can't play golf three days a week and be present with your wife. Now, I'm not saying don't do anything. I'm not saying like ball and chain have to be home all the time. I'm just saying, you know, we had season tickets for Clippers games for many, many years because you could buy those for like $12 a year back in the day for the LA Clippers. They're a little more expensive thanks to Chris Paul and Blake Griffin now. But, but back in the day, you know, we had season tickets and I, I didn't go to a lot of games because of that, all right? In order to love your wife, you have to be physically present. That means limiting your hobbies, now, I didn't say eliminate your hobbies. I didn't say stop exercising. I'm, I'm just saying, are you out five knots a week hanging with guys and doing stuff? You got to be present if you want to love your wife, all right? Uh, working too much. There's a great little book written by Andy Stanley called Choosing to Cheat. You could read it in like an hour, or I can summarize it for you right now for free and save you $10. Here's what he says, all right? Here's what he says. In fact, I have men read it when I take them through a leadership process. He says, at some point in your life, your work is going to demand a lot, and your family is going to demand a lot. He said, and you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to make a choice over which one you choose, and it might be a costly choice, and someone might even feel cheated. So he calls the book Choosing to Cheat. He says, because if you don't make the decision to prioritize your family over your career, at some point you might find yourself working 75 or 80 hours a week and not having kids anymore that want to talk to you and having a wife who's, who found a guy at the gym, all right? So what I'm saying is be present, all right? And I also want to say, I want to say this too. Like, let me just get legalistic here with you for a second. I just tell you, you might, look, if you work at night because you're a police officer and you work second shift or something like that, I get it. It might be an exception. You're a nurse, something, something different like that, like you work odd hours. But I would just say try to be home five nights a week. You know, if you're out, if you're out, Four or five nights a week, that's too much. If you travel a lot, don't come home and go hunting for four days the minute you get home. All right? Choose to be at home. You have to know your wife, all right? And, and, and one of the things that I realized is when you're considering whether or not you should do something at any given time, someone calls you and they say, hey, I've got tickets to this game. You want to go? Then if you're 50-50, what choice should you make? Always choose your family. When in doubt, in fact, memorize, say it with me out loud. I'll say it first and repeat it after me. When in doubt, choose your family. All right, one, two, three. When in doubt, choose your family. Somebody's like, hey, I got tickets for this game. You haven't seen, tonight's back to school night for your kids. Go to back to school night over the game. You can't get that back. All right, you have to be present, all right? You also need to be mentally and emotionally present as well. So I don't know what your thing is, if it's Sports Center, if it's Facebook, if it's your phone, if it's watching TV, if it's doing work at night on your computer, if it's playing video games, whatever it is, if it's reading theology, because you're so smart like that. I'm just saying, look, your phone is work that you haven't agreed to. All right, so how do you know if you're, if you're present? Ask your wife. You feel like I'm here for you? Physical presence, emotional presence, all right? Don't ignore that nagging feeling that you should be home, because then you probably should be home if that's what you're thinking. See what I'm saying? Good. Number two, how to love your wife. Realize that the commitment that you have made is to love a sinful, 
frustrating and flawed person. Can I get an amen about your wife? Amen. Yeah, your wife is frustrating. I don't know, or I'm just saying everybody's wife is frustrating at times, right? So you have made a commitment to love a sinful, frustrating, and flawed person. Young single guys, at some point, you're going to meet some hot girl who's amazingly beautiful, who you're super attracted to, because that's how God has worked it out. And you might, you might get married, and then you'll go, oh my gosh, this, yeah, she's nuts. <laughs> Word, what he said. She's nuts. Like at some point, you'll get home and you'll go, I mean, we, we got in our first fight on our third, on our third day of marriage at the Motel 6 next to LAX. You're like, man, you're a real Casanova taking your wife to the Motel 6 next to the LAX for your honeymoon. It's because we were getting on a plane and all the, all the hotels were booked, and so we had to just stay for the night. We got in a fight, and I realized, I, mean, I remember getting out of the car like and walking home like four weeks into our marriage. I don't do that anymore. We've been married for 23 years. Now I'm like, hey, you drive me home before I get mad. <laughs> so I'm just saying you are committed to love a frustrating and flawed person. Now, right now, you might be saying, Brian, you don't know my wife. She's crazy. I can't love her. My wife is crazy, all right? Your wife is sinful, frustrating, and flawed, and you are sinful, frustrating, and flawed. You are so much more jacked up than you think you are that your wife is like, why does he think like that? <laughs> all right? You're as jacked up as your wife, and she's stuck with you, all right? Think about that, all right? Don't expect the perfection out of your wife that belongs to God alone. You know where I got that line? I use it in the wedding ceremony that I've married probably 100 couples. Don't expect the perfection out of your wife that belongs to God alone. All right, your marriage will never be completely smooth sailing because you're two sinful, flawed people. Consider the church that Jesus loves. Love your wife like Christ loves the church. What does the church continually do to Jesus? Just be perfect? No, uh-uh, all right? Number three, don't allow yourself to fantasize. How to love your wife, don't allow yourself to fantasize. So many marriages have been destroyed because men built a whole fantasy life outside of their marriage. All right, when you start thinking about that woman at work, man, and I've, I've known dozens of guys that I've been involved in counseling with guys and pastors, and you start thinking about that woman at work, you're like, I'm not doing anything, I'm just thinking about it just thinking, then you're already, on, you're already on a bad road. Don't allow yourself to fantasize because fantasy is destructive. I love, love, love this passage from Proverbs 5. I can't remember if it's going up on the screen or not, but let's see. It's a warning against adultery. It is. Look at this. Drink water from your own cistern. Don't you kind of want to stop and say, dang it, drink water from your own cistern. That's what it feels like. What are you doing? Looking at somebody else. Flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. You were attracted to her at one point or you wouldn't have married her. All right, you're like, she's old now. Well, you're old too. <laughs> and, and, and you're losing your hair on top of that, although it's growing on your beard, right? I read a thing a couple years ago. This is not in the sermon. It's just a comic relief break. I read a thing a couple years ago that said, we spend $2 billion a year trying to rid hair of places that we don't want it, and $2 billion a year trying to grow hair in places that we wish it would grow. So anyways, all right. Resist the myth that there's someone else out there, all right? Resist that myth. I love this quote, too, from Stanley Hauervoss. He says, we never know whom we marry. We just think we do. Or even if we marry the right person, just give it a while, and he or she will change. For marriage, being the enormous thing it is, means that we're not the same person after we've entered it. The problem is learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. The problem is learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. That's crazy, isn't it? All right, someone better than your wife? Here's what Tim Keller says in his book, what's it called? It's called The Meaning of Marriage. He says, why discard this partner for someone only to discover that person's deep and hidden flaws? I mean, right after I got married, we moved to Huntington Beach. And there are some beautiful women on the beach in Huntington Beach. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been down there during the U.S. Open, but there are some beautiful, fairly unclothed women down there. 
And I, and I was doing youth ministry. And there's like 17 and 18-year-old girls that you can picture what they look like in my youth ministry. And I realized really quickly, I've got to, I've got to learn to think right, right away or I can't even do ministry in this area. I'm sure Las Vegas is like that. I mean, anywhere in the West where it's warm and people don't have clothes on and it's a party environment, you've got to remind yourself, I can't fantasize. Fantasy is clearly sin, and it oftentimes leads to action. All right, number four is always look to serve your wife. Always look to serve your wife. What does it look like to love your wife? It means to be present. It means to realize that you're you committed to love a sinful, frustrating, and flawed person. Don't allow yourself to fantasize. Number four, always look to serve your wife. Now here's, here's what I'm saying. Put your wife first. Make her coffee first before yours. Take her on dates that she would like. Um, your model here is Christ himself. I can tell you because if my kids were all sitting here, they would tell you our dad does this. So, you know, I use an AeroPress to make coffee. You know what an AeroPress is? Makes a good cup of coffee. And we have two AeroPresses at my house. And I always make my wife's first. I'm not bragging. I'm not saying that I'm awesome. I'm saying that's my commitment. I'm just saying I always make her coffee first. I drink my coffee black. She drinks her coffee with cream and sugar. I hate putting cream and sugar in her coffee. It's like, oh, I can walk over there and get the, I can, you know, but I, I even keep her coffee in the left side so I can always make her coffee first. And my kids have watched me do that for 17 years. My kids have watched their dad put their mom first for 17 years. Not enough food, I serve myself last. There's a book that's called Leaders Eat Last. It's kind of a new book. I think I haven't read it. I just saw the title. I'm just saying, always look to serve your wife. Put her before you all the time. So you really like sushi and your wife doesn't like sushi? Don't go on a date to sushi. Go to sushi on a business lunch with a friend. Put your wife first. She likes chilies. You feel like chilies. Fajitas, isn't that so 1989, you know? So, but your wife likes it, you take her there first. Always look to serve your wife. That's what we see. We see the model of Christ. Love your, your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The whole of the gospels portray Christ as the suffering servant. So look, the key to being a great husband is not to boss everyone around or like I'm the man here, you know, or to exercise your headship, but to love your wife unconditionally by being the chief servant in your home. Now, when I leave, when I leave the house, and I, you know, I'll travel about five times this fall. I don't travel at all for like four or five months in the summer. And then I'll travel four or five times in the spring and four or five times in the fall. My family approves of every trip that I go on. So if I get invited to go somewhere, I want to make sure that I try not to be going on Friday nights. There's no football game tonight, so that's why I agreed to come. Because there's no, I mean, my daughter plays in the marching band. And so I try to go to all those football games because nobody in the marching band is watching the football game. I am, but nobody else is, right? So, so, I, so I'll travel a few times, but every time I leave, I say to my boys, what are you going to do while I'm gone? And they say, the chief servant, chief servant. I've been telling my boys that since they were like five. It's rooted in their mind. Andrew knows. You know, Andrew's 6'5". He's at home hanging out. He goes to school Monday through Thursday. He knows when I come home, he better have served the family when I'm gone. He knows that. I've taught him that and I've modeled that. All right, number five, recognize the roles that your wife plays and acknowledge them. This isn't in the text. It's just, it's just loving. And I, and I learned this because I realized 10 or 12 years into my marriage, my wife just felt like, I've helped you do this and this and this, and I don't even know if you've noticed so you ever walked in the house before and your wife cleaned the whole house up or the whole kitchen up or made some meal and you just go right into complaining about work today? You know, and your, your wife spent like, because you it takes a long time to clean the kitchen when your kids trashed it, you know? And then your wife cleaned the whole thing up. She could do it in 10 minutes and it takes me an hour, you know? And then when you don't acknowledge the roles that your wife plays, so you're just disrespecting her. All right, so notice what she does and thank her. Recognize that she does a lot of stuff that you never even see. Notice the things that she does around the house and constantly thank her for the massive contribution that she makes. Just a couple days ago, I had to be gone. I live in South Orange County. I had to drive to Upland, which is in the Inland Empire. Then I had to drive over to uh, El Segundo by, the, by LAX. I left at 6 in the morning. I got home at 6 at night. That's not a normal day. I'm don't, don't, not usually gone that long. Then I had to, do, I had to hire a new assistant. So I had to do a job interview at 7 o'clock, and I had one hour is all I had. 
at, at home. And that's, that's not super common. Usually I'm present to my kids at night. I, I get there, my wife is like ready at six o'clock with spaghetti. You know, which is kind of our, that's the one thing everybody in our family can agree on. All right, so she's like spaghetti. She has it all ready, six o'clock, boom, she wanted it ready right when we were done. All right, right when I was done. And I, I want to stop there and say, thank you so much for doing that. That's so thoughtful. Because she's worked hard at that. See what I'm saying? Recognize the roles that your wife plays and acknowledge them. All right, so married men, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Love your wives as you love your own bodies. Be present physically, mentally, emotionally. Realize that you're loving a jacked up person and you're jacked up as well. All right, don't allow yourself to fantasize. Serve your wife. Recognize the roles that your wife plays and acknowledge them. All right, are you ready, single dudes? Say we're ready. ready. Is there a couple of you here that are single? All right, married guys, I'm sorry that you don't get off the hook. The single guys only have four and you have nine. So but you're the one that took a marriage vow. All right, here we go. <laughs> it's like everybody loves Raymond. All right, how to, how to love a woman as a single man, all right? So keep listening, all right? The Bible's call to men in general is to love others in a selfless, sacrificial way. So how do I love a woman as a Christian single man? All right, this is number six, but it's the second set, all right? Treat Christian women with respect as Christian sisters. All right, remember, the way that our society treats women is destructive. Women do not exist for your sexual fantasy and pleasure. That's not why they exist. They don't exist so that you can see that short skirt and go, man, look at that. That's not why God created women. Women are created in the image of God, and they play an extremely important role in God's plan. So Christian women are your Christian sisters. And is it right to lust after your sister? It's not, right? It's gross, isn't it? In Arkansas, he said. I don't know. I've never been there. But it's not right to lust after your sister. So don't lust after your Christian sister. All right? We don't make sexual jokes about our sisters. Some of your media intake might, might be dragging you into a thought process that's contrary to truly loving your Christian sisters. Now, what about unbelieving women? So you see somebody walk by you, Clearly, this woman is not a Christian. Clearly, she doesn't love God. She's doing everything she can to attract somebody with her clothing and her behavior. Here's what I would say. Women who don't believe are in desperate need of the grace of God. All right, don't date them or abuse them sexually and don't lust after them. Pray that they would come to know Christ. So if you're a single guy, you're, you, you're, it's not about sexual conquest for you. All right? We treat women like our Christian sisters. We treat them with respect. We protect them. I guarantee you, like I have one sister, and I guarantee you if you try to hurt my sister, I would stop you from hurting my sister. If you try to hurt one of my daughters, I would stop you. I don't care how big you are, I would hurt you anyways. All right? That's how we need to look at our Christian sisters like that. All right, number seven. So single guys, look, well, I'm gonna, let me go to number seven, then I'll talk more about this. So, number seven, keep your hands off of any woman that you're not married to. Man, if I could just give you one, like, you remember in the Matrix, like, swallow this pill? If I could just give you, like, the one magic bullet. Let me give you the magic bullet that could completely change your entire life. Keep your hands off of a woman you're not married to. Single guys. That seems so 1980s and 90s, doesn't it? You're like, man, that's so, like, true love waits. You know, that's not, that doesn't work, right? I love this girl. Or I got to, you know... I'm just telling you, uh, you know how much marriage counseling I've done? Thousands of hours. And you know what happens? When you, when, when you are active with that girl, I'm trying to be careful how I say this because there's kids in the room, but when you're active with that girl before you get married and then you get married, you know what you, know what you just did? You brought baggage into that relationship. And then you, you know what? The, the fun times that you could have after you're married are not the same. I'm not saying you ruined your life forever. I'm saying you brought a huge amount of baggage into that relationship. So I remember when I first started to date my wife, you know, I was, I'd been a Christian for three or four years. For me, I just, I didn't want to screw it up. I'm like, I, so I said to my wife, I've said this publicly many times, so I'm just being honest. I said to my wife, and in this, I know it sounds like I'm all puritanical here, but I said, I'm not, we're, we're not going to do anything until we're married. 
when we kissed and all that, I was just really careful. It's like, how far is too far? I, well, I don't want to, I don't want to screw this up. So I'm not going to touch your body until we're mar- until we're married. And we dated for a couple of years, and there, you know, you start to love each other, and you both want that. We waited. I'm telling you, 23 years later, we have a great marriage where we love each other, and we've never been in sexual dysfunction counseling. And I've never, we've never had to deal with the 12 men that she that she slept with prior. And the I'm just now look. Let's say you messed it all up before, and in your last seven years, you've ruined everything. Start today, from from today forward. Don't touch any woman that you're not married to. Because if she's your wife, you don't want to bring that baggage into your marriage. And if she's not your wife, guess who she is? Somebody else's wife. And you're bringing that baggage into their marriage. I'm just telling you, magic bullet. And guess whose job it is? Is it the man's job or the woman's job? It's your job. It's your job to not touch her. Even when she's like, man, I just love you. No, no, no. Because that will happen if you get real close. It's your job to set the standard, all right? Now look, if you have already completely messed this up or if you're messing it up right now, today's it, tomorrow's a new day. Go to one of your pastors and elders and say, hey, I I, I need some help or an older Christian brother, like I need to stop doing this. Apologize to the person that you're active with and say, hey, from now on, we need to live like God wants us to live. All right, number eight is fight the urge to look at porn. Man, you know, we could talk about this for 10 hours, couldn't we? I just want to, I want to say a few things to you. Porn degrades and dehumanizes women. Now, I know that industry fairly well because I've taken, I've taken uh, tours of Hollywood in the middle of the night. I have a friend who runs a ministry in Hollywood. So I uh, just want to be careful what I say. All right, so these guys are, they're looking at phones anyways. All right, so look, you, you know how most porn starts? It starts because girls moved to Hollywood from the Midwest, all right, from other parts of the country. At least this is, this is what I hear from a lot of people behind the scenes in L.A. Everybody's running away from an abusive relationship. Dad abused him, running away, come to Hollywood, going to be famous. Now there's all kinds of people sleeping under bridges in Hollywood. If you drive through Hollywood, you'll see all, commu- it's ma- mainly kids, teenagers. But guess what? You can go over to that warehouse and you can get paid 500 bucks, is what you can do. And you need food. And that, that's, that's how this happens. All right? So when you're, when you're looking at that, and you're like, man, this is awesome, this family. I'm not touching anybody. I'm not hurting anybody. Just remember, that's probably somebody who's getting paid 500 bucks because they were abused their whole life, who's trying to make a little money so that they can eat, who's sleeping under a bridge in Hollywood. And I'm not exaggerating. Go out there and go visit the, the ministry called My Friend's Place in Hollywood. It's right there in downtown Hollywood on Sunset. It's full of all of those girls, and those stories are being told every single day. I'm just saying, tell yourself that. Someone's daughter is doing that act. That girl was probably sexually abused who is doing that act. She's separated from God who's doing that act. And it damages your ability to even be attracted to a normal woman. I have a friend that I've been, that I've been working with for many, many, many years, He's in his 30s. I've known him since he's 20. He's not married. He can't even be attracted to a normal woman. He can't because a normal woman's got to be so like bling, you know? And I'm, I'm looking at him going, you're like a, you're not bling, you know? So I don't think you're going to find some supermodel to marry you. But that's the only woman that will measure up. I'm telling my boys that right now. I'm like, if you spend six or seven, eight years, look, read what's being written about this now in the secular world. What's being written about porn in the secular world is, is they're basically saying men don't have the ability to perform in real life. They don't. They can't be attracted to a regular woman. It's creating all this sexual dysfunction. I'm just saying, look, if you're in the middle of that right now and you're doing that all the time, what I would say is, again, you got to start fighting that. Now, there's, this is a big topic. I, how do you fight that? You have to believe there's something better. You can't, like, white knuckle it forever. You have to actually believe there's something better. If you put a crappy hamburger on a plate and then you put like a Ruth's Chris steak on a plate, I'll probably eat the steak because it's better than the Whataburger or whatever from over there, you know? You have to believe there's something better. If I go to Disneyland, there's a bathroom outside the gate. You ever been in that bathroom before? It's right outside the gate. When we had little kids, we'd have to go in that bathroom. There's like pictures of Mickey Mouse and stuff on the wall. 
Imagine just hanging around in the Disneyland bathroom all day going, man, this is awesome. There's Mickey Mouse on the wall. There's something better inside. You understand that? Inside the park. You have to believe there's something better. God created this. You want to conquer this, you have to believe there's something better. All right, now I can't, this isn't a whole sermon on this tonight. I'm just saying, you've got to fight this. You've got to stay in the battle. you got to talk to one of your pastors, elders, friend, go on battling this. I want to fight it. I want, to, I want to work at it. I want to believe there's something better here. I want to honor God. I want to do it God's way. All right? Don't, man, single guys, do not bring that burden into your marriage. I was sitting in a biblical counseling class 20 years ago with Wayne Mack, and he said, I have never, he's written like 10 books. He said, I have never known a man who looked at porn who stopped when he got married. You're like, I'm going to stop when I get married. No, you're not. No, you're not. You got to fight that now while you're still single. All right? Number nine. By the way, let me say this. I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm, I'm trying to tell you the truth and say, hey, men, this isn't good for us. Something better. It's not good, so let's stay in it. Let's fight it. Let's, 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 let's see that God's way is better than this way, all right? Number nine is call every woman that you know to be the woman that God wants her to be. Single guys, how do I love a woman? Married guys, how do I love a woman? Our society is, is promoting women to be so much less than who God has called them to be. Call her to be the woman that God wants her to be. Now, what, is what, what does God want every woman to be? To be in right relationship with him. To put her above all other things. To live with biblical femininity. To be sexually pure if single and sexually faithful if married and to use her gifts to serve him. So if you're married, love your wife as, as Christ loved the church and as your own body. If you're single, treat Christian women as your sisters. Keep your hands off of your own or someone else's future wife. Don't look at porn made by women who are trapped in slavery and headed away from God. And let's all call every woman that we know to be the woman that God wants her to be. All right? With me on that? I just heard, let me close with this. Let's see if I can remember. I just heard Steve Timmis say the other day. Steve Timmis is the executive director of Acts 29. He's written a bunch of books. He's raised four kids. He said, creating, as Christian men, creating an environment where those who are under our care can flourish. All right, that's biblical leadership. Creating an environment where those who are under our care can flourish. God, I pray that, man, there's so... That we probably, so many of us, God, in this room have messed up some of the things that I'm, that I'm speaking on tonight. First of all, I pray, God, that these men wouldn't sit under condemnation somehow. We know that we don't have to somehow um, do everything perfectly to be made right with you. We're right with you because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. But I pray that in light of the fact that we're right with you, that we know you, that, we, that, we're, we're, that we, we're in intimate relationship with you, I pray that we would choose to live life in your way because we know that it's, that it's a better way. You created us. God, so I pray that even repentance would go on in this room tonight where guys would say, man, I have not treated my wife the way that I would like to going forward. Or I treated my wife so badly we're divorced, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, I'm gonna, going forward, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look to treat women differently. For the single guys here, help them have a vision of what a great marriage can be. Help them see that they can look at guys like us who have really fought for this and try to do it the right way and see that they can have a fulfilling marriage that's, that's how you intended it to be. And God, I pray that you would stir these men uh, to, to living this out. In Jesus' name, amen.